go, ninjas and ninjets. Chapter one, the butterfly. Outside of my mom's netting, the first thing I remember is my real dad, Richard Bruce, building a haunted house in our basement. I must have been two years old at the time. My brother Rob, my sister Teresa, and I explored all through that haunted house, which he had built out of blankets and shit like that. He recorded this tape of his voice saying, I'm over here, I'm over here, find me, I'm over here. And he hid the tape player under some blankets. We crawled all through that haunted house, all dark and scary, until we found the tape recorder and realized it wasn't really him. To me, that was the shit. The only other thing I remember about my real dad, Rick, was him throwing a TV set at my mom. She was standing at the bottom of the stairs and he was up at the top. They were arguing. He disappeared from the top of the staircase and came back with a TV set and threw it down at my mom. She had to yank me out of the way as it came crashing down. That is the very last memory I have of my real dad. I can't believe that I actually remember something that happened when I was only two fucking years old. But I do. Them times must have really been major incidents for me to still remember them now. After that, Rick and my mom Linda officially split up. The last thing they did together was to pull all the money out of their joint bank accounts so they could divide it up and go their separate ways. Going out to drive away, Rick suddenly grabbed all the money from my mom's hands and jumped in his homie's car and just took off. That was the last time my mom ever seen him. He never paid no child support or nothing. My mom was just left assed out. That's why if I ever meet my real dad again nowadays, I have no choice but to beat his ass. Leaving us kids forever never bothered me at all. I was happy as a kid without his ass around. Snatching that money from my mom's hands though, and leaving her to struggle, trying to find money to feed three kids, that calls for an ass kicking in my book. And this is my fucking book. Even if I don't ever see him until he's like 80, I have no choice but to beat his old ass. I'll monkey flip his ass out of his wheelchair if I got it. With my real dad gone, we were mad poor, but we lived in a pretty nice suburb of Detroit called Burton. It was just off 11 Mile Road, which is about 3 miles north of Detroit in Oakland County. My mom worked nights in Birmingham, Michigan as a church janitor. So while she was gone, we were like stray dogs out there. But I didn't care, I have no complaints. I fucking loved all of it. When my mom worked the late shift, it just meant we were allowed out until she got home, which was the bomb. I hate it when people front like, oh, I was raised so poor, it was horrible as a little kid. That's bullshit in my eyes. I don't think being broke ass poor really affects you until you get to middle school and high school. That's when other kids notice you have shitty clothes on and you're gripping a piece of shit bike and some dirty ass $15 track shoes. At elementary school level of life though, you don't really give a fuck if you're poor. Nobody does. Nobody notices dumb shit like that. All you really care about is playing, adventure, pretending, and all that fresh ass little kid shit that comes for free in life. During the summertime, my mom would drop us off with Mary Wool. I guess Mary was somehow our summer babysitter. I don't know where or how my mom met her, but I remember this lady was a fucking witch. This bitch was straight out of hell. She was pure evil. Today, as a grown ass ninja, I look back in awe at what an evil bitch this lady was to us little ass kids. I'm sure she's still a horrid bitch today if she's still alive and hasn't fucked off yet. My mom would drop us off over there at 8 in the morning when she went to work and pick us up around 6 when she got off. Mary's idea of daycare would be to leave us outside all day in this fucked up fenced in backyard. On the hot days, my brother, sister and I used to dare each other to go up and ask Mary Wool for a drink of water. If we did, she would just bitch about it. Sometimes she'd squirt the hose at us. Like I said, she was a witch. I don't think my mom really ever knew how bad this lady was. I mean, she knew that Mary Wool was a bitch and all, but I don't think she ever really knew just how bad she was. Even if she did, there was nothing we could really do. My mom was even more broke now with my dad gone being a 
janitor and raising three kids alone. She didn't have the funds to hire us a Mary Poppins lady, so Mary Wool had to do. When I say there wasn't anybody else to watch us, I mean literally there wasn't nobody else to watch us. My mom had no other choice but the Mary Wool hellhole. My grandma Delilah Grover couldn't watch over us because she was always ill. She was in and out of an insane asylum for the whole second half of her life. The way my mom explained it, when my grandma was in her 20s, right after she had her kids, things went bad for her. She was really beautiful and people used to stare at her a lot. She began to become paranoid over it all. Everyone constantly staring at her and talking about her under their breath. She just went insane from it. Flat out paranoid schizophrenic, I guess. She'd come home every weekend, but she'd just be mad doped up not saying anything that made any sense. She usually would just sit there in this big red chair and smile at us. She died about 25 years ago. My mom says that my grandma is now super happy in heaven because her soul is finally free from her sick mind and body. My grandpa Val Grober, he couldn't watch over us back then either. He was way too busy working his ass off all the time. He constantly worked. He was a great person. From the time his wife got sick and went away until she died, he stayed with her. He never left her for nothing. My grandpa was the fucking bomb. He used to teach golf and do landscaping. He worked hard right up until he died about 13 years ago. Some consider him a local Detroit area golfing legend. So I hear. The only other family we had were my two uncles. They both were busy living their own separate lives and neither one had any time to watch over us. Now my mom's two brothers couldn't possibly be any more different from one another. First of all you got my uncle Larry. He worked his way through college and has, in my eyes, schooled it in life. He is every bit of what you would call a model citizen, a good family man. He was always known as Rich Uncle Larry to us because he would always help my mom out with 80 bucks here or 100 bucks there. He saved our asses many a times when we were kids. He seemed so rich to us back then. Now that I'm grown, I realize the only reason Uncle Larry seemed so rich to us back then was because he wasn't on welfare like the rest of us. He wasn't really that rich at all. He was just chilling. And then you got my other uncle, Uncle Steve. He was pretty much the crazy ass gone wrong uncle. He did an eight year prison bid for robbing the gang of 7-Elevens when I was a kid. He was a drug addict with a gat. When he got out after his long eight, he came to live with us for a while on the tether. He was always ripping off my grandpa, my mom, and just always giving everybody hell. He even ripped me off a few years ago when I gave him two of each of all of our CDs, t-shirts, and every other kind of ICP merchandise we have. He said he wanted it all to start his own collection, so I gave him a fat ass box of shit. Two days later, a friend of ours from a local record store called and said some crackhead older guy was just up here trying to sell a complete two of everything ICP collection. That bastard Uncle Steve. Anyway, Uncle Steve later passed away from a methadone overdose and is no longer with us. So that's the demise of Uncle Steve. Now that you're familiar with my entire family, Hopefully you realize why we are stuck with Mary Wool. There just wasn't anybody else to watch us. My mom knew we hated her, so every time she came home sick from work or something, she'd always come get us from Mary's house with the quickness. If we complained about Mary Wool, all she'd say was, there's nothing I can do about it, I don't know who else to get. She was telling the truth, there really wasn't nobody else. Rob, Teresa, and I tried to make the best of it in that fenced-in backyard. The only good part was this brown dog from across the street. Some days, he would dig a hole under his fence when he heard us playing, and he would make his way over to us and hang out with us for the day. Then, at the end of the day, we would return the dog, fill in the hole that he dug, and say goodbye. We would do our best to hide the dog from Mary Bitch-Ass Wool because he was the best thing we had going for us over there. We loved him, and that would have been reason enough for her to put a stop to it. The rest of the time was passed with the help of our imaginations. We'd find an old lawnmower or something, and we'd be like, let's turn this into an airplane, you guys, and let's actually build an airplane. We thought for sure 100% we could actually do that, you know, 
dreams that would last a day long. The fact is that children will be children no matter where you put them. We still managed to gain some pretty fresh memories out of that yard. One time, a big June bug landed right there in the dirt in the middle of us. We all sat around and stared at this crusty ass fucking June bug. You know those ones you see stuck to the side of the trees? It's one of them things you only notice when you're a little kid, like ant hills and caterpillars. When was the last time you actually saw a caterpillar? or crusty ass June bug shell stuck to the side of a tree. When you're a little ass kid, you notice that stuff because it's all you got going on. So that shit matters. This June bug looked like it was about to die, yet it was crawling on the ground. It was old, wicked looking, and crusty like a little ugly ass monster. And then all of a sudden, a split cracked right up its own back, and it was crawling out of itself. We were tripping out. To any adult, I'm sure we just look like some kids huddled around playing in the dirt right then. But fuck that, we were witnessing something worth watching that day. Slowly but surely, this beautiful yellow and green fucking bug climbed right out of its own old crusty ass and left nothing but an old dead shell of its former self. We sat around and watched this whole thing happen. It took hours. I thought that shit was the fucking freshest thing I'd ever seen. When it was all over with, the beautiful yellow and green bug expanded its new strong wings and finally flew off, probably to go kill some other bug and eat it. The whole shit was awesome, but soon after that things were back to normal in that yard. Let me tell y'all, this Mary Wool lady, there was some bullshit going on in that house. She had two kids, Chris and Ricky Wool, who were right around our age. My brother Rob and I hated playing with them. See, they had this fucked up habit of unzipping their pants and waggling their dicks at us and chasing us around like that. We figured they were that way because of their mom, Mary Wool, who was a heroin addict looking skinny bitch with tattoos on her wrist. And remember, this was 30 fucking years ago when moms didn't have tattoos on their wrists and shit like that. One day, when my mom was picking us up, I asked her about Mary's tattoos. What's that weird writing on Mary Wool's little chicken wrist about, Mom? Don't ask questions like that, my mom said. After what would wind up happening to us as a result of knowing the Wool family, I kind of wish I would have known more about them then, so I could have killed them all off and most likely have gotten away with it because of my youth. Attention! Thugs, killers, and mass murderers. Everybody sit down in a circle around me. It's special emotional time. In this part of the book, I'm going to talk about two major childhood memories that really don't have anything to do with anything at all. They're just too important not to be included. If you're not interested in listening to me babble about life and emotional shit, just skip past this next part. For everybody else, here it goes. Before my mom met my second dad, that's how I remember my childhood by what dad I was with at the time. Two truly magical things happened that still live with me today. They were both major events of my childhood, and that's why I want to share them with you. Major childhood moment number one. The first thing happened when my brother Rob and I were running around in my mom's front yard in Berkeley. He was six and I was four, and we were chasing one of those colorful, humongous ass butterflies. Suddenly, my brother started screaming, Joe, Joe, I got it. Rob had actually caught the butterfly. I was pretty fucking shocked and so was he. So was the butterfly, I'm guessing. I don't really know how it happened, but I guess he jumped off the porch and actually cupped it in his hands, mid-air. It's prying my hands open, it's so big, he yelled. Get the jar, get the jar. We had a jar with holes poked in the top, which we always kept on our porch because we'd always catch shit like grasshoppers and praying mantises, anything fresh. We put this giant butterfly in the jar and we sat there staring at it. Wow, it was mad powerful looking. We noticed it had fur on its wings and all kinds of colors. It didn't even seem like an insect. It seemed more like a bird. We felt really guilty about having it in our jar, like we caught somebody's dog or something. It felt like an animal more than an insect. 
We said to each other, look man, we're just gonna have this butterfly spend one night at our house and we'll let it go in the morning because this is way too big and too beautiful to keep. Besides, we don't know what it eats or anything. We'll have to let it go. We agreed. And as soon as we got up the next morning, we let it go. That night, it would be our guest. We just wanted to hang out with it for one night. We poked extra holes in the jar lid and put a screen over it to hook it up more. We had a fan in our room because it was mad hot. And we put the jar right in front of the fan. The butterfly was our guest and we wanted it to be extra comfortable. We tried to sleep, but we kept hearing the butterfly's wings hitting the glass jar like it was talking to us. It was the shit. We were mad excited. Next morning, all we could hear was the fan. My brother and I looked at each other in horror. Then we looked up at the jar. The butterfly was dead. We were straight up crushed. Right there, brother, we started fucking bawling our eyes out. We felt like we just murdered somebody, actually. I guess we did. That sucked bad. So here's what we did. We dug a grave in the space between our house and the house next door. It was already a cemetery of sorts because this cat across the street was always killing birds and mice and shit. And we would find their bodies of the animals and bury them in that area. There was this place across the street that sold potato chips in a big metal can. So we got an empty one and made it into the butterfly's final resting place. We put a little couch in there made out of napkins and popsicle sticks and all kinds of other cool shit. With tears in our eyes, we placed the can in the grave and filled the dirt in on top of it. We felt so bad. We made a vow right then and there, a vow that we would continue to live by today. One day, we will make it to heaven so that we can make sure the butterfly made it and so that we can apologize to that butterfly face to face. If insects are not allowed in heaven, then we would ask to change that policy on the butterfly's behalf. Now if you look on every single ICP album and EP, what does it say in the credits? It says dedicated to the butterfly. It's right there on the inside of my left arm as well. A big tattoo of a butterfly, also dedicated to the butterfly. I dedicate every major accomplishment in my life to the butterfly. I do this to remind myself of that important vow we made as kids. We must both keep on track all the way through life. I'll tell you why. Because back then, that day, burying that butterfly, feeling the way we did, my brother and I were like two clean cloths, unpolluted yet by light, pure and true. When we made that vow, we were the real untouched Joe and Rob Bruce. It was from the heart. As we go through life, we adapt to what really goes on in this world, and it teaches us. Other people in life teach you things like, hey man, don't hang out with girls unless you're trying to fuck them, dude. Or, what are you doing hanging out with those black kids for? The more you come in contact with other people, the dirtier you get. When you're a child, you go only by your heart, because that's all you know. As I grew up, I reminded myself out loud. I made that vow when I was as pure as could be, before the world got me. When the only thoughts I had were the thoughts of my own in my own heart. I cannot let the world fuck me up so bad that I lose faith in that vow. As I write this, I'm fucked up. I'm very, very dirty from the world. One day I have to return to that innocent, pure thing that I was so that when I die, I can apologize to that butterfly. That's what dedicated to the butterfly means. That's exactly what I intend to do. Okay, let me just put it to you like this. If I was sitting on a public bus next to an old lady and I said a cuss word like fuck out loud, she'd probably be offended. She might even make a face and say something about it. Well, don't think she didn't spend her life sucking on dicks, being human and cussing herself, right? The only difference between her and I is that now she's returned to that pureness she once had as a child. She's been all the way around the block. She's probably seen it all before, and now she doesn't even want to hear the word fuck. She wants to be clean again. 
Well, there was a time when she was swigging booze, fucking around, tossing salads, sucking some guy's dick at a dance and all that. Now she's cleansed herself of that craziness. The old people you and I don't care about, those are the wisest fucking people out there. They're the ones who've seen it all. They've tasted both styles of life. And now in their old age, they choose pureness because they're wise. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, the butterfly. I'm almost done, just listen. Everything I do that I care about is dedicated to the butterfly. I take something so filthy, so raunchy, and so devoted to hate and revenge and anger like my albums, and I stamp dedicated to the butterfly on them because that was Joe Bruce who made that vow. Today's Joe Bruce wouldn't make that vow, but the future Joe Bruce will, and I will become him again one day in the future. Just don't say fuck next to me on the bus when I'm 90, or you might get a cane upside your melon. Major childhood moment number two. This is the other magical thing that happened just a year after the butterfly incident. There was this kid in the neighborhood named Mark Walensky. He was older, probably 10, and he had about a foot on us in height, and he always walked around with a crew of bullies. We were terrified of him. He was a little baby thug. He was a troublemaker too. He once set a garage on fire and bragged about it. He only got away with it because he was too young to get prosecuted for it and his parents were so white trash they didn't give a fuck. Luckily for my sister Teresa, she was always off hanging with her girlfriends at Skate World or something. Rob and I hung out on our block with assholes like Mark. Mark was always beating somebody up, usually my brother and I. A bunch of times I'd be riding on my bike and he'd stop me and he'd be like, get off your bike. He'd throw me off my bike and take it. He'd make me chase him around before finally giving it the infamous ghost ride. That's when a bully takes your bike from you, rides it as fast as he can and hops off it. Then you have to sit there and watch your bike race down a block with nobody riding it until it smashes into something. All you can do is watch it smash into something, usually a tree or a car or sometimes a wall of some sort. You just have to hope your bike ain't too badly fucked up afterwards. Many of my childhood bikes were casualties of ghost rides. Now my mom hadn't married her second husband yet and we were still poor as fuck. She was still a janitor, but to make extra money, she started watching this rich family's kids. When the family went to Boston that summer, they wanted to bring my mom along to watch their kids. It wasn't a vacation or anything, but we were pretty excited about my mom getting to go to Boston. My mom had never been out of Michigan, so it was a big deal for her and us. We ran around the neighborhood for months telling everybody, my mom's going to Boston, my mom's going to Boston. So everybody knew my mom was going to Boston. Because of our little big mouths, everybody knew that she left 50 bucks with me and my brother and sister to buy food with. That was like millions. We're talking pizza every night, ice cream, chips and dip, root beer floats, all that shit. We bragged about it to everybody that would listen. Right after my mom left for Boston, my brother and I were in our front yard. Who comes around? Mark Walensky. He walked right up to us. Hey, what's up, you guys? My brother and I were really nervous because suddenly he was being mad cool. We tried to be cool, too. What's up, Mark? I said, hoping to save my new Huffy from a treacherous ghost ride. What are you guys doing, man? You, like, want to go do something? We were nervous and marked out. We just said, sure. After a few hours, Mark got an idea. Hey, ask if I can spend the night. Well, you know, my mom's not here, I said. Yeah, I know. Ask your babysitter if I can spend the night. It'll be fun as hell. I heard you guys got chips and dip and everything. Rob and I were still sort of dazed. We were scared to death. We didn't want Mark Walensky's fat ass eating all our chips and dip and everything, but we were too scared to tell him no. So we went to our babysitter and straight up lied to her. Hey, this is Mark Walensky, I said. He spends the night all the time. My mom knows him. Truth is, my mom would have killed me if she knew a delinquent like Mark Walensky was spending the night at our house. The next thing we knew, Mark was knuckle deep in our French onion dip, spending the night eating all our pizza and everything else we brought. We even had sparklers. 
It wasn't even near a holiday, but he was having fun with them. He was the only one having fun. We were still scared of him, almost as scared as we were of my mom finding out he spent the night. Then something happened that night that changed everything. Actually, it changed everything for the rest of my life. We had our blankets set up on the floor at the top of the staircase with all the lights off. We were trying to whisper to each other in the dark, but the babysitter could still hear us and she kept getting pissed. Be quiet, you guys, it's bedtime. All right, we said. We kept right on talking. All of a sudden, a head, a pitch black head came up the stairs in the dark, then shoulders, totally fucking silent. A black oil figure was walking up the stairs. It was dark in the room, but this figure was pitch black dark. We could make it out as clear as anything. Now, we would have been pissing our root beer floats in our underroos, but the only way I can explain it is that I wasn't the least bit scared, neither was my brother Rob. It was more like 20,000 levels of excitement. Just like when you bungee jump, like when you first hit the air, like holy shit! The figure walked up the stairs right in front of us. My brother and I were screaming, but the most amazing thing was this. Mark Walensky couldn't see it. He didn't know what the fuck was going on. What are you guys looking at, he asked. What is it? He couldn't see it. The shape continued to walk up the stairs. It walked all the way up and turned right toward us. Mark Malinsky still didn't see a fucking thing. My brother and I couldn't make out his face, but we knew it was looking right at us. Clear as day, we knew exactly what it was. It was kind of like we knew exactly what it was right when we first saw his head coming up the stairs. It was God. No question, no doubt in my mind it was God. Fuck you if you don't believe me. I know what we saw that night. G.O. Diggity D himself. The Holy Roller Thunderbolt of Funky Fresh in the Freaky Flesh. God, baby. He turned and raised his arms. Then he put him down and slowly floated back down the stairs. Just from that one gesture, we knew the shape was saying, It's all good. My brother and I were so fucking scared all night, so nervous about Mark Walensky, and it was like God came over to two innocent ass kids and was like, I know you're scared, but it's all right. After that, we didn't give a fuck about Mark Walensky. I was like, you didn't see it, you can't see it, ha ha, you couldn't see it. I wasn't afraid of anything. I wish y'all could see the goosebumps on my arms right now just from talking about this shit. Even though I would have a more involved spiritual encounter later in life, that was the absolute greatest moment in my life. A miracle had just happened. We'd seen God. We'd heard him say so much without even saying a word. Fuck Mark Walensky. Fuck everything scary. Nothing is scary in the presence of God. When my mom finally came back from Boston, we ran out and started hugging her. We wouldn't let her get out of the car. We were all crying and telling her what had happened. That we had Mark Walensky spend the night, but God came over and told us not to be scared. My mom saw us crying and she started crying too. Everybody was crying. The only person not crying was Mark Walensky, who quickly returned to his old self again. Within a few days, the same old neighborhood bully dickhead was back in effect. He called me coming back from the party store a few weeks later and thanked me for the chips and dip with a good old ghost ride for my huffy. It was all good. My mom knew we weren't lying. We told our grandpa too and everybody else who would listen. We didn't need to hear anybody give us props for what we had seen. Seeing what we had seen was props enough. A lifetime worth of props as far as I'm concerned. My mom was always religious and she did work at a church. I was five years old and this kind of shit was already happening to me. First, our vow to the butterfly. Then God coming over and telling Rob and I everything was going to be okay. And you wonder why I think the dark carnival is so real. Chapter 2, Life with Satan Everybody's got a fucked up childhood. I'm convinced of that. Everybody has tons of heartbreaking stories about how bad they always had it growing up. Especially us rappers. I hate when people tell their fucked up sad childhood stories to anybody who will listen 
because most people tell them just to get attention. It's almost like they're trying to get props for it or something. Well, fuck that. I ain't trying to do nothing but be real. I'm telling my fucked up stories in this book only because they happen to me and they are a part of my history. They got me here today. I ain't trying to get any extra special props for what happened to me growing up or trying to get any extra special attention. The only reason I'm mentioning this shit is because it's what happened to me and it's true. So here it goes. Life is like a long ass road. Not all the places my road has taken me have been the shit. There have been many roadblocks and ambushes along the way so far. When I was probably six years old, my mom finally remarried. I never understood why, but our new stepfather would be a 50 year old rich but ugly as hell bastard by the name of Lester Wool. That's right, he was actually a member of the dreaded Wool family. He tricked his way into our family. He played like he had nothing to do with the rest of those evil wolves. He totally, completely fronted his way into our lives. I remember it today, and I feel the anger ranging through my body thinking about how fucking fake and phony he was as he tricked my mom and the rest of us into thinking he was nothing like the rest of his fucked up evil family, but he was worse than the rest of his family. He was the grandfather of the family. He was the fucking granddaddy wall master himself. He was none other than the father of the horrid bitch Mary Wool. On top of that, he was the grandfather of those two horny little rugrats, Chris and Ricky Wool. Lester met my mom during the second summer that Mary Wool was taking care of us. I must admit, at first, he seemed like the only Wool family who had a heart. And it was as if God gave all the love and compassion to Lester Wool and forgot to give any to the rest of that devilish Wool clique. He'd come around the backyard and ask his scary ass daughter Mary shit like, What do you got those kids in this muddy ass backyard for? What's wrong with you, Mary? Then he'd turn to us and be like, Come on, you guys, get in my car. And he'd take us out to a fair or something. He was steady playing the role of super fresh. Once a week he'd pick us up and take us somewhere fresh like Chuck E. Cheese or whatever. I remember he worked for Chrysler and he seemed well paid. He was well paid. He had a big rich ass Chrysler car with power windows so he must have been rich. My mom was at a really bad point in her life and Lester played the savior by hooking us up with groceries and all kinds of shit trying to make us think he was the superhero we needed. He had conned his way into our lives by acting like he knew how fucked up the rest of the wolves were. Anybody out there who's ever had a new stepdad trying to work his way into the family knows exactly what I'm talking about. Mr. Fucking Nice Guy, until he gets his way in. My mom was 30 and he was 50. My mom's interest in him was his money because she needed it to help raise us kids. My mom's main interest was taking care of us kids and she would do whatever she had to do to do that. With it, she could provide a decent life for her kids. She was willing to sacrifice her own happiness for us, but it would end up being the worst mistake of her life. Their marriage only lasted two wicked years but it burned a lifetime of pain into my whole family. You see, little did we know it at the time, but Lester Wool was the devil himself. The first thing he did was move us all into a new, bigger house in Berkeley. Cool enough, I was young back then, so my memory is weak. But from what I'm told now, and from what I can recall myself, this is what started happening once we got into that house. Lester Wool started growing his horns. First, he started sexually abusing my sister Teresa. I'm told it was bad. Thank God I don't have any specific details, but from what I know, he repeatedly molested her time and time again. This was the cause of my sister's many problems to come, all because of Lester Wool. I don't know exactly what he did with my brother because to this very day we never talked about it. Not once. I don't think I could ever handle knowing exactly all the things Lester did to them. I don't care about myself and my problems with Lester because I feel like I can handle bad things happening to me. But when something bad happens to Robert or my sister Teresa, it feels like it hurts me three times as bad. 
All I remember Lester the molester doing is grabbing me and grabbing my dick piece. He'd grab it and look at me with his fucked up half smile on his face and ask me shit like, do you know what this is? After sick shit like that, Lester just got worse and my mom didn't have a clue as to what was happening. She was always away at work and we were too confused and young to tell her what was really going on. We were after all children, very young children and we were filled with shock and horror. One time I had my friend Willie spending the night. His name was Willie Spassage. What a fresh ass last name that is. We were up laying up late one night watching the Three Stooges. And I guess my mom was either sleeping or not home for whatever reason. That sick bastard Lester came walking out of the bedroom butt naked with his robe wide open. He walked right in front of the TV so we all could see him. Then he came back from the kitchen and did it again. In fact, he walked naked like that back and forth a few times. I was speechless. I remember being so fucking embarrassed. I didn't know what to say to Willie. I never even looked at him. I just pretended I was suddenly asleep. We both just laid there on the floor, fake sleeping for the rest of the night. That's one of the worst memories I have. The worst thing I remember Lester doing in that house was kicking our dog, Duke. He would just run up and fucking kick Duke for nothing at all. And send him flying across the room. Sometimes as soon as my mom left for work, Duke would lie there trying to catch his wind after that. We always thought Duke was going to die every time that faggot Lester kicked him. After Duke got kicked, he would have trouble walking for days. Seeing that was far worse than Lester grabbing my dick. I'll tell you that right now, seeing Lester kick our dog Duke was far worse than anything Lester ever did to me. I'd rather that sick fucker grab my dick and rip it off than kick our dog like that. To me, seeing my dog get kicked was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. We loved our dog Duke more than anything in this world, and we tried to stay outside with our dog as much as we could to escape the cruelty of the demon that was now our stepdad. We couldn't do anything about Lester's abuse because we really didn't know what the fuck was going on. It was just beyond our understanding, or at least mine. They say that people who molest their kids were molested themselves. I can't ever fathom that, molesting a kid. To this day, I'm a fucking 43 year old man and I don't have any idea how the fuck he found enjoyment in any of that. My sister Teresa got it from him really bad for years and I think my brother Rob may have gotten it worse than me. But I'll go to my grave before I want to know what happened to them in detail. As close as we are, we just don't talk about it. And we probably never will. We hopefully never will. I dread the day if we ever do. I was so young, that famous molester technique of him saying, you better not tell your mom, actually worked on me. I never told my mom. My sister being the oldest was, thank God, the first one to break the stale silence. And she told my mom, by the time second grade started, I knew the entire Wool family was fucked in the skulls. From time to time, Chris and Ricky Wool would come around our house to see their grandpa, my stepdad. By now, they'd outgrown waggling their dicks at us, and they had moved on to bigger weirdo shit. One day, Chris Wool and I were up in my room after having a snowball fight at the park. We were changing out of our wet clothes when it happened. Let's have sex, Chris said. What the fuck are you talking about, I asked without the word fuck. At the time, I didn't even really know what sex was. I mean, I sort of had an idea, but I always figured that sex involved a chick. I mean, I still figure that. Listen, Joe, just take your clothes off and lay down on your stomach, Chris explained. I always knew that there was something wrong with him, but now I knew just how wrong he was. He was already trying to have gay sex with my butt at nine years old. I have no problem with gay people, but having gay sex at nine years old? Come on, man, please. Buttholes just aren't ready for that shit yet. Even at seven years old myself, I already knew my butthole would never be ready for that shit ever. No, I said. No, hell no. We don't got a kiss or nothing like that, he pleaded. Me and Ricky do this all the time. Just lay down on the bed and I'll do the rest. 
That was it, I freaked out. I got dressed and ran out of the room. I found my brother downstairs and I told him what Chris Wool had just said. Without a word, Rob walked right up to Chris Wool. You have got to get out of here right now. Rob being a lot taller could have easily kicked his ass. And that was it. Chris and his younger brother Dicky, excuse me, Ricky left. Thankfully, as fate would have it, that was the last time we ever saw Chris or Ricky Wool again. I mean, we'd see them time to time, but we never spoke to them again. I wonder where they are now. They're probably all grown up and married right now, terrorizing some innocent family the same way their grandfather, Lester the Molester, terrorized ours. Now that I'm a grown ass, old ass man, things are much different. If I ever run into Lester Wool's tired frame again, I'll kill it. Don't get me wrong, I'll do my best to get away with it too. I ain't that stupid. A life sentence would suck right about now. But I will flat out kill his ancient old ass. Believe me, I'll simply sneak up to him, probably in his wheelchair, and take my two fingers and pinch his windpipe shut and stare him in the eyes as he slowly dies. I yelled that ever since I was old enough to know what murder was. My brother Rob screams the exact same thing. We ain't looking for Lester Wool. We ain't trying to track him down or anything. But if fate has it someday that we happen to cross paths with Lester Wool again, he's a dead ass motherfucker. I'll simply follow him home and end his evil life. I'm hoping I'd see him somewhere walking up a staircase or something. Imagine how easily it would be. He's got to be older than Moses by now. So I'll just give him a little sweater tuggy tug and watch him roll down the steps backwards. Crumbling and dying. Until finally cracking his head open on the floor. It would look so accidental that nobody would ever suspect a thing. I know Lester Wool is headed to hell when he dies anyway. I just wouldn't mind if that process was sped up some. I know he's been on Satan's VIP guest list for years. He's probably got a luxury suite complete with acid bath water, a king-sized bed of nails waiting on his ass, not to mention 24-hour room service, only hell's favorite dish to enjoy. Fresh, hot, severed human ass with a fork stuck in it. Back to my story and how Lester's reign of terror finally ended in our household at least. One late afternoon, I was at my friend Willie's house, the same Willie who watched the Naked Nut Three Stooges special with me, and Rob came bursting into the bedroom to get me. Joe's gotta come home right now, Rob explained to his mom. Willie and I dropped our Legos. What? Why? What's going on? I asked. Then Rob said the freshest words I've ever heard. Mom and Lester are getting a divorce. Rob and I ran all the four blocks home, happy as fuck. We jumped up and down the whole way. We could hear crashes and smashing coming from our house all the way down the block. When we burst into our front door, my mom was bawling her eyes out and throwing dishes at Lester, who was standing there looking like Uncle Fester. As all hell came crashing down around him, with shit smashing all on the walls behind him, he just slowly made his way into the bedroom to pack. My mom didn't stop there though. Even with him locked in the bedroom, she proceeded to break everything he ever bought for the house. The Richie style lamps, the pictures, all that fancy faggot Chrysler money shit he added into our lives. Everything. It was crazy as hell. I remember that night like I remember right now. My brother and I were cheering her on. This is the craziest part. We were actually jumping up and down on the couch while all this was happening. My mom could see how happy we were and it just made her cry more. She knew how much we hated that asshole. She felt so bad about bringing him into our lives. She wanted him dead. We were so happy. We started grabbing dishes ourselves and throwing them with my mom. Even in her state of panic, she wasn't having that shit though. After 10 minutes or so, Lester the molester came out with his suitcase and limped out the door. He jumped into his big ass ho ass Chrysler and drove the fuck off. Who knows where he went? Who cares? For all I know, he drove his big ass power window Richie car right the fuck back to hell where he came from. Ever since then, I've always hated Chryslers, and I still do. Fuck Chryslers. Here's how it all went down. 
I guess earlier that day, when my mom came home from work, she found a note written by my sister, Teresa. The note told it all, everything. My mom was finally hearing the truth about her evil husband for the very first time. The note told in detail of all the molesting, the physical abuse, the beatings on our dogs and us, and the sickness, all that had been going on for the last two years. The note also informed my mom that because of all of this, my sister had run away. According to the note, she was never coming back. I don't have any idea what went through my mom's mind during those two hours she was home before Lester got home from work, but I'm guessing it was the longest two hours of her life. My brother came home before Lester did. He said my mom looked like she was in shock, like the devil was standing there and had her in a chokehold. He said she was just blank faced and breathless. I guess that the second Lester walked into the house that evening, the war began. That's when my brother came and got me. Lester knew he had been caught. He was busted. The cat was finally out of the fag. I mean the bag. My mom finally knew that he was nothing but a faggot ass, abusive dick sucker in need of a bullet in his forehead. When Lester Wool finally knew that he was nothing but a faggot ass, abusive dick sucker in need of a bullet in his forehead. When Lester Wool walked out that day, we would never see him again. Just like the other Wolves, Chris and Ricky and Mary. That was it. The real nightmare was finally over, but the dream nightmares would of course continue for some time. My mom put us all into family counseling to help us with the stress of the abuse that we endured, and it helped my brother and I to some degree, I guess. My sister, however, was affected the worst of all, and her memories are probably to blame for her mental problems as she got older. All my mom did during Teresa's teenage years was chase after her. My mom would find her somewhere and bring her back home. Weeks later, she would just run away again, over and over. Teresa eventually got heavy into all kinds of problems and all kinds of crazy shit. During the time after the divorce, my mom constantly asked my brother and I questions about what that asshole Lester had done to us. She was both angry with us and sad that we never told her about any of it. She knew that Lester's terror hadn't affected Rob and I as bad as it fucked up our sister. Teresa straight up went insane from it all. That took up most of my mom's time. She spent day after day, week after week, year after year dealing with my fucking sister's insanity. All this time Rob and I grew closer and closer. We both sat and watched my mom cry and grow crazy from what my sister was putting her through. There were so many stories of my sister's struggle, but all of them are bad, and none of them are really worth mentioning here. With the old pig gone, once again we had to move because his income went with him, and we were back to being dirt ass poor. My mom quickly found a cheap top floor dirty ass rusty roof duplex apartment in Berkeley. She had no other choice but to take it. The only problem was the crabby landlady didn't allow pets. My mom talked it over with us and ran an ad in the paper to give Duke away. But I still couldn't comprehend what was about to happen. Then one day, she sent me and my brother to the store for some shit. And when we came back, our dog Duke was being loaded into a van by a lady with a bunch of kids. Duke seen us coming and started to bark and cry as they put him inside. Rob and I ran as fast as we could, dropping our shit and everything. As the van drove away, Duke barked at us from the back window of the van. And then the van turned the corner and Duke was out of our lives forever. Our best friend. It was the worst day of my life and I was mad at my mom for a long time after that. Even to this day, I haven't fully forgiven her for that one. My brother Rob was hurt even worse than I was. I didn't write anything in this book about how fresh of a dog Duke was because I didn't think y'all would be interested, but he was by far the freshest dog I had ever known, and we loved him so much, as much as one can possibly love another. Later, the neighbors who lived underneath us got a little faggot ass poodle dog, and since they were friends with the landlady, she made an explanation to the rules and let them keep the dog, even though we had to give Duke away. I ain't gonna lie to you, shortly after that when our landlady had a heart attack and was in the hospital for a couple weeks, I felt a secret satisfaction. Yes, I did. It was just her bad karma, I guess. 
Our new home was like the fucking front lines in the war between my sister and my mom. As for Rob and I, as we got older, all we ever did was explore any forest we could find. My brother was getting more and more into role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, Car Wars, Boot Hill, Gamma World, Toon, and all them fantasy dice games. As for me, I was loving ninja movies and just getting into pro wrestling. I guess anything outside of reality was fine with us because for those years, reality more than just sucked at our house. Teresa continued her endless spree of trouble over the next five years. She was constantly in and out of children's homes, then jails, and then more jails. She was getting caught up with all types of druggy lowlifes who she just suddenly show up with and drag into the house. I hate to keep talking about this, but just like this part of the book, the war between my mom and sister went on and on and on. These were absolutely the worst years of my mother's life. I can see it like this. Lester Wool was like the atomic bomb. After the explosion was over, life was like living under the black dust cloud, poisoned by all the radiation. I remember my mom and sister's violent fights at the house. Punching, hair pulling, biting, even some good old dish throwing. I absolutely hated every second of it. It was fucking horrible. I swear to God I fucking hated that shit. The older Rob and I got, the easier it was to deal with. Fantasy kept us happy and busy. Rob and I were out on our own. From the time I was nine years old on, I was mentally gone. I stayed in a fantasy land and I'm still there, of course. I had a roof over my head and there was some food around sometimes, but we were always gone. Nothing mattered to us ever but adventure and being out of the house. My mom just got so wrapped up in my sister's problems and working two or three jobs at a time, she didn't even have the time to deal with us much anyway. That's the truth. She loved all three of her kids more than life itself, but she could only do what she could only do. Besides, Rob and I were okay without her all the time. We were straight up good kids. Not nerdy, smart kids with good grades. I just mean, we weren't no fucking Mark Walensky's. Ghost riding ninjas bikes and shit. I wonder just what makes an asshole an asshole. Some people are just born to be assholes, I guess. Rob and I were always good guys. Rob way more than I was though. Give us a comic book or a D&D game and we were fucking straight. As God is my witness, I didn't say a cuss word once until I was 17 years old. My brother Rob didn't cuss until he was in the army. I really don't know why. We were just the kings of words like frick instead of fuck. We would say shit like mofo instead of motherfucker. Here, I'll give you some of the anti-cussing vocab that we had mastered back in the day. Dick was wang. Fuck was frick. Bitch was witch. Faggot was homo, shit was she, cum was skeet, and still is, asshole was whack. I may have dropped out of school at 16, but I didn't cuss till I was 17. By then I had so much cussing built into me that I would start a career cussing by the time I was 19. You'll hear about all that boring dumb shit later. Besides my family having to all move into a Barbie doll toy upper flat apartment after my mom got divorced, we were also dirt poor again. A family of three, four when my sister was around, living off a of janitor's income. We all got our clothes from the rummage sales that were held at the church my mom worked at. They would have these big ass rummage sales once a year because my mom worked there and they knew we were poor as hell. They let us have first pick every year. Great. We were privileged scrubs. In elementary school, you know how there's always that one kid who's notoriously a scrub? The kid everybody swears they saw eating his own boogers and some shit? Well check this out, that was me all day and then some. I never ate my boogers or nothing, but I did worse. When I was in third grade, I had this shit so bad I couldn't hold it. And let's just say my butthole geyser erupted. I clenched my ass cheek shut as hard as I could, and I asked to be excused. I stood up and walked down the hall to the bathroom. And just when it seemed under control, it wasn't. I took my poopy butt drawers off and wiped my butt as clean and as fast as I could. But then some other fifth graders came walking in and almost caught me in the act. 
I left the bathroom with the quickness. The only problem was, I accidentally left my shitty drawers in there on the floor. Pretty soon everybody in the school knew it. How did they know? I'll tell you how they knew. Because my mom had written my full name on the waistband of my underwear. You see, a few months earlier, my brother and I went to summer camp hosted by the church my mom worked for. And they had everybody write their names on their underwear for camp laundry. Just my Bruce brother luck. Not only did all the other kids know I had dumped in my pants, but they weren't gonna let me forget it. Those ruthless fuckers put my shitty drawers on a stick and chased me around the playground with it. Finally, the teacher stopped them and threw my drawers in a big plastic bag. They called me into the office and told me that if my mom wanted my shitty underwear back, she could come and pick them up before 5.30 that day, or else in the morning. Aw, oh, thanks. And Rob and I were legendary scrubs in Berkeley. We had little to no friends except each other. Bad Luck was our six-man tag team partner in grade school. Remember how in elementary school all the students would pay a dollar every day for a hot lunch? If you didn't have a dollar that day, it was okay. They would still feed you, but that meant you owed them two dollars the next day. Well, at our school, they would actually announce the names of the kids who owed money for hot lunches over the PA system every fucking morning. Every fucking morning, they would give the day's announcements, and too many times it sounded something like this. And lastly, blah 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 owes money for a hot lunch. Jim Astley, Jimmy Beckford owe money for two lunches. These students owe over three lunches. Tim Heckle goes for four lunches, and Robert Bruce and Joseph Bruce need to stop by the front office this lunch period. It was like the billboard charts to me. The higher up the list, the more fucked off you were. We were always down in the in trouble last part because we owed so much fucking lunch money at the time. The whole class would turn around and look at me. I fucking hated that. Think of how fucked up that is that the school would actually do that. Announce the kids' names who owed money. How could that be helpful? What do they think they're gonna do, embarrass the kids into paying the money? If you don't got the fucking money, you don't got the fucking money. There's no point to announce your name over the whole fucking school to the PA. It's straight bullshit. It's straight crooked evil shit they did, if you think about it now. And I know they don't do shit like that no more, they just can't. It'd be too fucked up. By the end of the week, the only students who would still owe would be Robert Bruce and Joe Bruce. Why the fuck did they feel the need to announce your fucking debts to the whole motherfucking school? Think about how cruel that is. By middle school, we were the brunt of everybody's jokes. The kids would always tease the girls. If you step on a cracked tile, you gotta kiss one of the Bruce brothers. So all the girls would walk down the school halls, jumping and skipping along, steady trying not to step on the tiles with cracks. Remember how I said being poor didn't matter until you got a little older? Well, in middle school, it was starting to matter. We had the same fucked up pair of shoes all school year. And then we'd come back from summer vacation, still wearing them the next year. The kids weren't cool about any of this shit either. Even the school itself was heartless. Now as an adult, when I think about how cruel my middle school was, it makes me want to go up there with a black jacket. I said jacket, not trench coat. We were so fucking poor, them years, we'd get food from the hunger barrel. No lie, the church would set up hunger barrels in my school and tell the students to bring in canned foods to feed the poor. A week later, those very church people would bring the box of canned foods right to our house. Let me tell you something about canned fucking 